heard some really amazing stories today, and we've heard some very depressing stories today. Uh, and I, I can imagine it's difficult to balance emotions um, between both of these things. Uh, and so I, I don't have a good or a bad story. I have a choice. Right? And the choice really is about what we have to do uh, in future. Right. And how do we deal with some of the challenges that are going to face us over the coming years, in particular thinking about things such as this whole fourth industrial revolution and whatever that means, but also some of the real challenges that we have. And even though I want to put forward this idea of a choice about what we do now for the future, I really want to start 100, 110 years ago and look at some of the challenges that came through a couple of different industrial revolutions. And what's happened in that process and where do we find ourselves today? So the 1910s, uh, which were long before any of us have direct memory of, uh, were a pretty dark and gloomy time. So people were in the middle of a massive industrial revolution at the time, mechanization, um, factory production lines had just come in, Ford was producing vehicles, and the whole fabric of society was being fundamentally changed at that time. At the same time, you had all of these challenges around political change, right, that led, after a kind of a number of different factors, to ultimately World War I, right? And so, you know, you had seven to 10 million people killed directly in, in what was called the Great War, including many people from South Africa. Um, and ultimately, this led to, amongst other things, the outbreak of what was then called Spanish influenza, which killed about 100 million people across the world, right? So we were concerned about Ebola a few years ago that killed tens of thousands. Spanish flu killed twice the population of Southern Africa in a period of 18 months. So things were not great, right, in the 1910s. And they suffered a, a group of different problems. There were political challenges, and really this was the collapse of empire, as it were, right? So the German Empire collapsed, the Russian Empire collapsed, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, all of them just kind of collapsed at that point in time. And the British limped on for a while, but it wasn't too long before they kind of succumbed to this entirely. There was economic collapse related to this. There was massive war, and there was technological change. And so these things all kind of came together to create a very, very difficult period for the world across sort of 1910 to 1920. And it obviously followed on from that. So we saw that, you know, in the nine, late 1920s, there was the, the Great Depression, people throwing themselves out of buildings, literally committing suicide because they couldn't afford to feed their families. I've seen photos of people selling their children um, it, was, it was a horrific time for many people across the world. And that led you know, to a number of things. It led on to World War II, and et cetera, et cetera. But the point is that this, this nexus of factors led to fundamental change in the world. Now, this had some very interesting impacts in South Africa. And I'm going to keep on trying to tie this back to what happened here. At the time, the global economy was based on gold. Right? And we had what was called the, the gold standard, where you were able to go into a bank and the bank would exchange your IOU note for a specific piece of gold. And after World War I, in sort of 1919, that was cancelled. Now, at the time, South Africa was producing around 70% of the world's gold. Right? And we were, as a, as a country, the primary producer. We underpinned the global economy. And when they cancelled the gold standard out of the US and Britain, that had significant impacts on South African society and what was happening at the time. It led to, for example, the creation of the Reserve Bank in 1920, whose primary focus at that point in time was around protecting the South African exchange rate from all of these gold fluctuations. Right. And so a number of things happened, but essentially, South Africa was directly impacted as a result of these global decisions deciding what was happening ultimately with our mineral resources. And coming from that, that then led through many, many different steps to the 
crime against humanity that was apartheid that led to the continuation of the mining industry in South Africa. But these global changes directly connected back to South Africa, principally through our mining industry. Now, I want to fast forward by another 50 years to the 1970s. This is just after the third industrial revolution, right? the development of microchips, of computer systems, automation, not quite where we are now, but certainly the development of computer technologies. Now, if we think about the 1970s, what do we see? We see that the world is in the middle of a number of wars. The Korean War had just finished, Vietnam was just kicking off, and the Cold War was anything but cold at the time. There was massive political change happening through a number of different, different regions. You had these massive fights between sort of communist East and the capitalist West. You had a number of different political fights happening. The economy suddenly went into free fall across a number of effects. So things like the, uh, the oil shocks that happened in the early 1970s, there was a massive drought in the US in the mid-1970s that had America borrowing corn from its arch enemy Russia just to feed itself. So there was economic collapse, there was a war, there was political turmoil, and at the same time, there was this technological revolution happening. And so the, the social fabric at the time was going through very much what we saw in the 1910s, and if we think about today, we are seeing the same kinds of things. We see the kind of political unrest that is happening across the world. Right? Globally, we have questions around uh, dictatorships, the rise of this kind of white supremacist narrative in places like uh, the US and a lot of Europe. We see in places like South Africa, you know, uh, the, the speaker this morning was showing our deep uh, mistrust of political systems within the country. We've certainly just experienced a massive economic upheaval over the last 10 years, starting in 2008 where we had this entire financial crisis, and that has continued. There was a, an article published a couple days ago uh, looking at the number of businesses that are profitable in South Africa, and it basically turned out that 80% of income tax in the country was produced by 0.01% of private companies, right? The rest are all non-profitable, right? So economically, we're in this really difficult position. We are certainly at war, and this is not obvious, but there is an enormous amount of digital and cyber attacks happening across the world on a constant basis. Um, there, sort of go online and just look up real-time cyber attacks, right? They are happening in the thousands per minute, and they're all tracked. So there is a very, very real uh, active espionage warfare happening, it's just not at a personal level, at least not yet. And this excludes things like Syria. It excludes things like the rise of terrorist activities like we've just seen in Christchurch in New Zealand. It excludes the constant ongoing fight between India and Pakistan, right? It excludes what's happening in South Sudan, right? And you sort of go on, like the level of violence has increased. So we're going through the same, the same challenges today that we went through 50 years ago in, this, in the 1970s with the, uh, with the Third Industrial Revolution. And it's the same as what we went through 100 years ago with the, the end of the Second Industrial Revolution. So what choices do we make? Now, there is some good news to this. I, I did say that I wasn't going to have a good story, a bad story. Right. The 1920s, right, despite challenges towards the end of the, the period, was a golden age compared to what had been done previously. And the reason for this is because they'd managed to completely restructure how things worked. They'd seen that the old order wasn't working in the 1900s and the 1910s, and they redesigned how things worked. 
That didn't quite work out for them, right? And there were many problems with that. But it was a restructuring of the rules of the game that led to an increase in the quality of life across the world and many benefits for many people. Coming out of the 1970s, the same thing happened. In the 1980s and the 1990s, there was this repositioning of how things worked in the world. And although many of these benefits didn't sort of follow through into Africa, if you look at the way that China, for example, managed to take advantage of these things, probably the largest single upliftment of humankind in a short period of time. China raised five, six hundred million people out of poverty in the span of 20 years. Like this is, this is a remarkable achievement. We are now at the same point. Right? We have a choice about what do we do, about what are the new rules of the game. So I mentioned in, in the 1920s, uh, South Africa was deeply affected by the gold standard when they shifted. South Africa was kind of uh, put at risk in this process. The same thing happened in the 1970s. So in the 1970s, what happened is that gold was still being used by many sort of central banks around the world to underpin their economies. And in 1971, uh, Richard Nixon, president of the US at the time, said, well, this is not going to happen anymore. We're just going to turn uh, the dollar into a pure fiat currency. So it is not backed by anything. And as soon as that happened, the gold price spiked and fell and went through enormous volatility. And it led to all sorts of challenges in South Africa with gold being the link between the rest of the world and our society. Now, there were some really interesting outcomes from this. One of this, and there's a sort of a direct chain, is that as the gold price fell, um, it became increasingly difficult for uh, the mining companies here to operate effectively, um, and they are driven primarily by profit motives. That led, amongst other things, to the reduction ultimately, or the, the removal of what was then termed sort of like the the differential job positions. So at the time, for example, in, in the mines in South Africa, a white person would be called a ticket collector on a train, and they would earn X salary, and a black person would be called a ticket inspector, and they would do the, exactly the same job, um, but be paid 10%. And as a direct result of these gold kind of ch challenges, the mining companies ultimately forced that to be kind of disregarded because it ultimately made more money for them. It led to the formation of NUM in 1982, Kusatu in 1985, and those led to the establishment of the Tripartite Alliance. That led to sort of the negotiations and ultimately 1994 and our democratic sort of system now. So th those were never the intentions at the time, like no one in 1973 when this happened thought, well, if we do this, it'll lead to that outcome. But these are the unintended consequences that led to this. But where we are now is that the connection to South Africa is a lot more tenuous. Gold is no longer used as a primary platinum, does not and has never fulfilled that role. So how do we still maintain a value-creating process connected to the rest of the world, given the enormous volume of mineral resources that we have, in a way that changes the rules of the games to benefit South Africa and Africa, not to the benefit of Europe and the global north. Because in the first revolution, certainly the global north benefited out of it. And in the second revolution, well, the second revolution, the global north benefited. The third revolution was really where China benefited out of this. And it is in this fourth industrial revolution where we can start asking different questions about what roles do we play here? How do we best utilize our resources for the benefit of South Africa and Africa? And a lot of that has to do with understanding what are the challenges that are happening, of building trust between all the different stakeholders. The mines are at fault for many things. People who claim to represent communities are at fault for many things. The government has been at fault for many things. But someone needs to take a stand and step forward and start building trust between all these different organizations, and not just within mining. Between mining, in agriculture, 
in banking, in all of the pillars of our society and our economy. And collectively, we then have a different choice about what we can make in the upcoming industrial revolution. So that just as the 20s and the 80s were golden periods in the second and third, we need to turn the 20s and 30s ahead of us into golden periods for South Africa and Africa. Thank you.